Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at Selwyn Avenue Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you found us online and are able to join us. We know that technology is difficult, so if you struggle with technology or if we struggle with technology this morning, our service can be found on Facebook Live, Instagram Live, and will later be posted on our website, selwynpres.org, and will also be uploaded to our podcast, which is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We are thrilled this morning to have Reverend Frank Spencer with us leading worship. Thank you so much for being here, Frank. In this season of COVID-19, we continue to welcome visitors into the life of our congregation. If you are interested in learning more about what it's like to become a member at Selwyn, you're invited to reach out to myself or any of our pastors. We would be happy to speak with you and our information can be found on our website. If you are a child or have a child, we are excited to share with you all that our children's cha uh, chapel platform has been moved online in the recent weeks. At 9.30 on Thursday mornings, we invite you to join us on Facebook Live as we tell the story in a creative way and offer other resources as we continue this summer to work through our series of the greatest stories ever told. We want to let you all know that our COVID task force continues to carefully monitor our situation here in Charlotte and that while we so desperately look forward to welcoming you all back into this space and into this sanctuary, for the time being we are going to continue to take care of each other by worshiping in this format and hopefully on the front lawn in future weeks and months ahead. We continue to accept gifts of offering during this time where we're worshiping at home, and we offer that in many different ways, snail mail, mail a check to the church, or also we have a text to give number, and that number is 704-734-9818. And finally, we've got some youth events coming up this week, which I am excited about, our sixth graders, our new ones, and all of our middle schoolers. We have excited to have a little get ready to come back, kick off this week. We're gonna have dinner and a tie-dyeing party on August 6th at 6.30 in a socially distant manner on the front lawn. And then this coming Friday night, the 7th at 6 p.m., we'll have our virtual game night. If you have any questions about that, if you'll reach out to me, I look forward to seeing all of you then. So friends, let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Tis the grandest theme for the ages wrong, tis the grandest theme for mortal tongue, tis the grandest theme that the world has sung. My God is able to do thee. He is able, he is able to deliver thee. He is able, he is able to deliver thee. Though I sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver me. As you are able, will you please join me in our call to worship? You who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, you will say to the Lord, God is my refuge and fortress, the one in whom I trust. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the refuge of God's wings. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, or the, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. The Lord, your refuge and dwelling place, says, those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When you call me, I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will rescue you and honor you. 
O Lord, we call to you now. Show us your salvation. Friends, let us pray. God, our Redeemer, draw unto us and draw us into you in worship. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, our minds to comprehend and our spirits to encounter the revelation you have for us this day. Transform us with the truth of your love and grace. In the name of the one who gave, us his, gave his life for us. Amen. no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you will, please join us together in one voice, confessing our sins to God. Eternal, Eternal God, God, in whom we, we live, live and move. And move and have, have our, our being, being, whose, whose face, face is hidden from us and by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, and with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults confiding in your grace and finding you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, our Son. Amen. Friends, hear now these words of assurance from Romans chapter 8. 
Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, who was raised, and who is the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here at Selwyn Avenue Presbyterian Church. Even if it is only digitally, it is good to be home. I picture each of you in your appointed pews as we worship God together. You should know that in keeping with the spirit of our electronic age, I am preaching for the first time from a digital uh, readout. And I am hoping that neither you nor it will go to sleep on me. <laughs> Let us pray. Holy One, Pour out your spirit upon us so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now the story we're going to hear this morning takes place on the plain of Babylon, but it needs a little context. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon when this story occurs, and he was the greatest political leader of the Near East at the time. His armies had conquered what was left of the Assyrian Empire and gone all the way into Israel and Phoenicia. They had captured Tyre and Sidon for trade on the Mediterranean and sacked Solomon's temple. They took with them the Israelites back to Babylon as slaves. Many were put to work in the fields or in manufacturing. The nobles, however, were often put into the service as bureaucrats because they were better educated and the noble women into the king's harem. In this context, Nebuchadnezzar decided that everyone in the world should know what a great king he was. Not only was he a great king, he called himself the king of the universe. And so he set up a gold statue 90 feet tall and commanded that when the music played, everyone should fall down and worship it. But when the music played, three of the Hebrew bureaucrats refused to worship, and the Chaldeans, as the Babylonians were then known, went to the king and complained about these outsiders who would not submit to the cultural dictates of the king. And so we pick up our scripture, listen for the word of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? 
Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to, pr to be present to present a defense to you on this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O oh, king, let, uh, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O oh, king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up to seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. And he replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and even the, not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and has delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. We will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. This was the statement that puts our heroes in mortal danger. Remember, they were high-ranking officials of the king's own court. But the king had crossed a line with which they could not agree. What were the gods to which they refer? Now, a cursory reading of history might suggest that it was Marduk, the Babylonian patron god of the time, but I contend that the gods Nebuchadnezzar worshipped were not very different from the gods on display in our country and our communities today. The first of those gods is materialism. Nebuchadnezzar went forth with his armies to capture economic power. The, it's, no, it's no coincidence that the statue is of gold to demonstrate his wealth. 
But materialism is not quite the same as capitalism as some commenters say today. Capitalism is the way in which human beings have exchanged goods and services for millennia. No, the problem here is materialism, the selfishness, the greed that corrupts economic systems. It is that sin that results in colonialism, in structural poverty that we see today, in environmental degradation as corporations pursue their own gain at the expense of everyone else. It is materialism that is the first sin. And closely associated with it is sexual exploitation. This idea of self-gratification that is so tied to materialism. It results in many terrible outcomes. The objectification of women. The abuse of women men, and yes, children, and sex trafficking that we see here in North Carolina, depending on which ranking you look to, North Carolina ranks as one of the top 10 areas for sex trafficking, and Charlotte is its epicenter. Wherever there is a Super Bowl or a political convention, you will see this sin and this horrible practice. Collectively, we see tribalism raise its head. This tendency towards my people, not your people, is exhibited by Nebuchadnezzar. The Chaldeans come and complain about these outsiders who will not conform to the culture. This tribalism results in hyperpartisanship that we see today. In fact, what surveys show is that your partisan identification has much more to do with how you view the world than your Christian identification. This hyper-partisanship is, is an artifact of tribalism. It leads to factionalization, intolerance, and yes, in the United States, our original sin of racism with which we are still dealing today and seem incapable of working through. The statue that Nebuchadnezzar is raising is getting bigger and bigger. And now he adds the power of the state. The power of the state makes the statue even larger. This power is one of violence. It is the only power the state actually holds over any of us, whether it is the violence of extracting material goods, limiting liberation, or at its extreme, the death penalty. The power of the state lies in violence. It leads to false patriotism, the elevation of symbols, over ideals. The idea that we must pledge allegiance to a flag rather than pledge our allegiance to human rights. It is a false patriotism. Every government that has erected a statue and now Nebuchadnezzar's statue is getting bigger and bigger Every government that erects a statue is sending a message. We have lots of statues in this country. Some are of our founding fathers. Those statues recognize not the flawed men who they indeed were, 
but rather the ideals that they supported. Equality, unity, democracy. But recognizing that the state intends to send a message and recognizing that the state's power is one of violence, the statues to the Confederacy that were erected during Reconstruction and Jim Crow and some as recently as 20 years ago send a very different message. They send a message of white supremacy, of subjugation of a particular group of people, black people specifically. And let me tell you, my great-great-great-grandfather was the first signer of the Ordinance of Secession in South Carolina. Two other ancestors also signed that document. And as their descendant, what I can say is that those statues are not about history. If those statues send the message, which they do, that any child of God is lesser than any other child of God, then they need to come down. End of discussion. And while we're speaking of God, let's add the fifth element that Nebuchadnezzar relies on, the claim of divine support. This statue was to be worshiped. This statue was to proclaim that Nebuchadnezzar was selected by God for this role, nay, was a God in the role of king. From the time of Rome forward, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, there has been this symbiotic relationship between church and state. The church proclaims that there is no salvation outside of its strictures and, in turn, talks of divine uh, relationships for king and government. This is a transactional salvation. It fits together. I do something for you, you do something for me. This transactional salvation has been with us since Rome adopted Christianity. Now, our reformers tried to take a swing at this, and they criticized the buying of indulgences. And for a little while, there seemed to be a backing off, but then there was the counter-reformation. Uh, 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 and in America, we are so attuned to this understanding of salvation that there has been a resurgence. In the Great Awakening of the 19th century and fundamentalism of the early 20th century, this idea of welcoming Jesus into your heart, are you born again? Have you been saved? Are you a Christian? This is transactional salvation and it fits very well with our economics and our politics. It is to be avoided. We will not serve your gods. This is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to the king, placing their bodies in nonviolent resistance to the violence of the state. This is what John Lewis did on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. This is what the moms have been doing on the streets of Portland. Is there a cause for which we would surrender our bodies? I have to tell you, it scares me to death. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know that the violence of the state is about to come down on, him, on them. But they do not resist. And this is where it gets real. 
They say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, but if not, but if not, they are confident that God will be with them in the flame. And so it happens. An angel walks with them through the flames of the furnace in contrast to the transactional salvation that buys into the false gods of materialism, sexual exploitation, racism, tribalism, violence, and false religion. We are offered a different way in Christ Jesus. Of course, the state leveled all of these same charges against that very Jesus. He healed the woman who saw visions and her owners complained to the authorities for their economic loss. He was accused of eating with prostitutes and set free the woman accused of adultery. He brought the water of life to the Samaritan woman at the well and traveled to the Gerasenes to announce the kingdom of heaven. He called out the hypocrisy of the religious establishment and the commerce within the temple. And for all this, for all this, the state levied the death penalty. But then the miracle of resurrection happens. Jesus has forever overcome death, and in so doing, he has taken away all the power of the state. When we no longer fear death, the state no longer holds any power over us. Consider Martin Luther King who said, I may not get there with you. He was not counting on his own life to complete his message. Or Nelson Mandela, who spelt, spent 26 years on Robben Island, only to come out full of compassion and reconciliation. The state could do nothing to take away Jesus Christ from Nelson Mandela. Or open your Bible and read the Apostle Paul, who was in and out of jail more times than I can count, and was ultimately executed. The Christian need never fear confronting the state. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew they were about to be executed. They did not put their faith in the outcome. They simply believed that God would be with them no matter what. That's God's promise. Not freedom from pain. Not freedom from hard times. Not freedom from suffering. Not even freedom from dying. We get all of that in this lifetime. But what we also get is God's unshakable love and God's accompaniment through it all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
As we enter into a time of prayer, I would like to invite you all to respond. When I say, let us pray to the Lord, if you will respond with, Lord, have mercy. Friends, will you join me in prayer? Most loving God, we know that you are creator of all good things. We know that you are with us this day as we continue to move into the unknown. Be our steady companion and guide to help us to rejoice and be glad, for we know it is a privilege to be alive today and to have the opportunity to live into being the people you call us to be. We pray for peace for our world and for unity of all peoples. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Church Universal and for all teachers and church leaders, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, you were once called the Great Physician, and so we pray to you for those who are physically and mentally ill. We pray for the health of our members and for all those caring for our loved ones. Bring your healing grace to all who are suffering. We continue to pray as a community for those who we love who are battling COVID-19 and for all those who care for them. Among those who are close to our hearts battling COVID, we lift up to you in prayer our very own Bob Hornberg. Wrap him in your loving arms, O God, and bring your healing grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. God of compassion, we pray for the weak, for the poor, for the vulnerable among us who are most adversely affected by the policies that we make as a state and nation. Protect them with your power and send us forth as your people, not only to care for them, but also to advocate on their behalf. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection and for all who have departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. God of Sabbath, you created the world with a natural rhythm of work and rest. And so we pray for all those who work and labor among us, that they would be treated with dignity and offered the opportunity to find rest and Sabbath in the midst of their labors and in these times of transition. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the deliverance from all danger and violence and oppression and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. God of love, give us hope for tomorrow and strength for today. Be with us when the way before us seems closed and when we don't know what next step we should take, lighten our darkness and let us walk beside you with trust we ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we now enter into a time of offering. Let us return to God the gifts of the earth and the offerings of our lives so that they might be used to bring abundant life to others. The text to give instructions will be placed in our chat this morning, but our text to give number is 704-734-9818. Come, let us return our offerings to God.
every good thing, all that we need and cherish, comes from God alone, in token of His love. We are His hands, stewards of all His bounty. God, for the wondrous gift of life, we are thankful. Your generous outpouring of grace reminds us of the fruitful life we are called to bear. May these gifts, therefore, embody our desire to share and contribute to your coming reign among us. Amen. And now, dear friends, let us say together to the Nebuchadnezzars of the 21st century, we will not serve your gods of materialism, of sexual exploitation, of tribalism, of partisanship, of racism. We will not serve your gods of the state of violence or of false religion, we will not serve your gods. And now, may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.